what I'm interested in is the thing behind the thing behind the thing, the thing under the thing, under the thing, under the thing, that I think deeply shapes um, things up at the surface. And so when you've sat there and you've heard something and you thought, we, people use words, they use words like it worked, it was relevant, it was inspiring, it felt like it was really condemning, it felt heavy, it didn't, uh, whatever. I think that sometimes some of the language that we use at a, sort of an emotive level there are actually reasons why certain communications affected us a certain way and others didn't. Why certain ways in which a person spoke led us into a certain kind of worldview that took us higher and did something to us and opened us up and, and other things seem to take us down a different route. And I think there's some things behind the things behind the things that may affect that. This is my premise. Where and how you begin the story and where and how you end the story shape and determine what story you're telling. And, and I'm looking at the big, big, big story because we communicate, preach, teach, and sermonize, a word we made up just for this weekend. Um, we sermonize out of whatever we think is the big, big, deep uh, story that kind of undergirds and underpins the whole thing. So let's begin in the beginning, always an excellent place to start. And let me just, um, and for many of you, this will be like, maybe like review or whatever, and I, I assume many of you will be like, okay, okay, get to it, get to it, get to it. Um, but I think it's always helpful to go back through um, the, the basics. Um, Genesis 1, God said, let the land produce vegetation. In a culture where it was common to worship the creation, you have a poem the Bible begins with in which the creator endows the creation, so they're distinct. The creation isn't to be worshipped. There is a creator that is distinct from the creation. An absolutely mind-bending, radical idea in this day. And the creation has been endowed with the, by the creator with the ability to make more itself. Um, the word dasha is where we get the word, is the word produce or to sprout. Um, there is a progressive generativity. The, the creation is going somewhere. It's been given the ability to make more. It isn't just God creates trees. It's trees come into being that have the ability with, they are empowered and endowed with the ability within themselves to make more trees. They are given this by the creator. Um, creation is going somewhere. It is dynamic, not static. Tomorrow will be different than today. So with the word dasha, what you have is it's going to grow, it's going to produce, it's headed somewhere, and these first people find themselves in the midst of something that is going to need to be guided and directed and managed and stewarded, but it, tomorrow it will have grown a bit more and a more and more, and produced more. In Genesis 1, uh, verse 26 and 27, so that they may rule, um, that they may fill the earth and subdue it. The, the word rule is the word rada, and the word subdue is the word kabash. Let me hear you say kabash. It, it's a word regarding responsibility and stewardship. It is, this thing is headed somewhere and these humans are placed in the middle of it and their task is to properly order it, guide it, um, and it is to provide for them, but they are not to use it or exploit it in such a way that it cannot continue to provide for them. Um, there is a participatory physicality. Genesis 1 and 2 is its material, its trees, its fruit, it's air, it's water, it's soil. There is a, a physical participation that is at the center of the human calling, participating with the creator, co-creators in taking this somewhere. There is a harmony that is intended, but is a harmony within hierarchy. There is a strong hierarchy based on there is a creator, this creator creates a creation, and then these people are placed over creation. This man and woman, these equals, these co-creators, 
then have responsibility for creation. So there is, if they at any point try and be God, that's not going to work. If at any point they worship the creation, that's not going to work. There is a harmony, but it comes from everything in its proper place, to quote Radiohead. And it's central to the poem, everything in its proper place, the appropriate ordering of creation. And then there's a word that's used uh, several times next. In verse 28 and, and earlier in verse 22, and God blessed it. The word baraka or baruch, or it's the word bless. Soil and spirit are united. Heaven and earth are one. In Genesis 1 and 2, there isn't somewhere else. Like if we could just someday get out of here, then some glad morning all fly away. In Genesis 1 and 2, there isn't somewhere else. The action is here. Are you with me? This is very, very, very important. Soil and spirit are united. It isn't soil, blood, dirt, food, sex, trees, soil, air, and then there is a realm of the spirit in some other place, and if you can just leave this and go there, you will have ascended to a higher state. In Genesis 1 and 2, it's all blessed, holy, and sacred. This is how the story starts. Now, a couple things. Whatever it is that you and I, that we love about life, is all right here in Genesis 1 and 2. Aesthetics, beauty, the appreciation of form, making things, relationship, partnership, worship, exploration, organizing, naming, learning, responsibility, whatever it is that you love to do, I guarantee you can trace its primal impulse, its most core essence, to something that you already find in Genesis 1 and 2. And people say, you know, I just, I love to like work in my the shop and I make things out of wood. Of course, it's taking creation, it's ordering it, it's doing something with it. Well, we have this co-op and we get from a couple of these organic farms and we organize it so people at, a, at an affordable rate can get really great, fresh, organic produce. Of course, of course. Music, poetry, I just like to work in my backyard. I've, I've landscaped it three different ways this year already. I just love it. I love the feeling of the dirt under my fingernails. Don't talk about you. Um, I love the feeling of, a, I love that green line I get around the base of my shoes when I'm mowing lawn. Arr, yeah, of course, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, it's all right here. Now, oftentimes you can evoke out of people, what is it? that when you do it, you think, man, I could do this forever. What is it that when you do it, you lose track of time? And often I've discovered when you start evoking these sort of questions and responses out of people and asking questions, oftentimes they'll say, okay, well, actually, I kind of am ashamed of this, but you know what I really love to do? And then they'll share something, and it's like this beautiful, pure sort of, but it's not practical, or you can't make a living doing it, or whatever it is. And how many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? And they'll kind of sheepish, you know, and sometimes you're like, you know, yeah, yeah, you're right, That's, that, that one's a little weird. But nonetheless, we embrace every, everything. <laughs> um, I just like playing the triangle. I don't know what it is. And I, well, you know, we each have our part. But um, body's made up of many parts. But um, the story starts here. The story starts here. Now, let's uh, go to the end of the Bible. Revelation 21, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. No more death, river of the water of life, the city, the tree of life, healing of the nations. I am making everything new. So the ending is really another sort of beginning. But anyway, um, the ending of the story is here. 
The story ends here, and the descriptions of the end of the story are very physical and participatory. They will reign, a callback almost to the Radah and Kabash, the, the rule and, and creatively order and, and manage and sustain. They will participate in the ongoing ordering of creation. The story starts here, the story ends here. And the descriptions that are given is uh, rivers and trees for the healing of the nations, everything in its proper place, a city. It's all very physical. Um, when, John, when, when John uses the language of new heaven and new earth and all that, if, that's actually a quote from Isaiah. Isaiah talked about how they will plant vineyards. It's all rooted, literally, in the earth here. In Revelation 21 and 2, where, where the, the story ends, the story ends here, and, and at that point there isn't somewhere else because God is here, dwelling with us. Oh, by the way, if you were to take sin out of the Bible, you would have a pamphlet. <clears throat> but it would have four chapters in this pamphlet. <laughs> If, actually, if you remove sin from the Bible, you would have a short book, Genesis 1 and 2, R Revelation 2, 1 and 2, 2. Mm -hmm. And if you were to place them, you would even then realize that it starts with a garden and it ends with a city. And what is a city? It's a lot of well-organized gardens. So even if you remove uh, sin from the scripture, you still have a movement. Why? Because in Genesis 1 and 2, it's not static, it's dynamic. It's going somewhere. And left to go somewhere, these gardens and the proper ordering, ordering of these gardens lead to a city filled with properly ordered, harmonious gardens leading up to a city. So even then, you have a movement. We'll come back to this idea of dynamic versus static, this idea of soil and, and spirit, heaven and earth united. There isn't, we'll keep coming back to this, but we have to make sure when we look at the story, story starts here, the story ends here. Now, let's back up. Genesis three then, what you have is the disruption of shalom. There is a shalom, the Hebrew word for wholeness, peace, well-being, health. Genesis 1 and 2 is a beautiful picture of shalom. There are several dimensions to this shalom. There is peace, health, wholeness between the created, between people and their creator, between people and other people, uh, people with themselves, they're comfortable in their own skin, literally. And then there is proper shalom with the soil, with the earth, proper earth care, should we say. So you have these multiple dimensions of Shalom. What you have then with, the, with sin entering the story is you have a disruption of shalom. And so maybe one of the ways you could, you could define sin is any way in which I am guilty of disrupting shalom. God, God intends the world to be a certain way. What are the ways in which I have participated in disrupting that Shalom, with my neighbor, with the earth, with my creator. So then also, another way you can see it, and, and I'm sure you have many other ways of looking at this, but maybe one of the ways is we could just simply say, sin then is rebellion against the hierarchy. If there's a harmony within hierarchy, their place is here, God's place is here, earth's place is here, then, then one of the ways maybe you can understand sin is simply it is rebellion. I don't like the way it's arranged. Um, it's saying to God, you're in my seat. Sin then would be any way in which we rebel against the hierarchy which has been placed there. An addiction to a substance of some sort, when we begin to look to the physical to meet certain needs that only God can meet, we are then rebelling against the hierarchy because we are looking to the earth to give what only, so we are essentially, we have the hierarchy out of whack. 
It's rebelling against the hierarchy. Another way you could say it is simply participation. If death enters the story in Genesis 3, then, and if, if dynamic, not static, is the way in which we understand the story, then what ways have I participated in the order of death, in the old order, in the way that isn't the way of God? It's my active participation in something other than taking creation in a proper direction. And, then, and one um, Hebrew definition of sin is an archery term, missing the mark. So it is this, there is this beautiful, beautiful picture we are given in this poem, Genesis 1, and the narrative in Genesis 2. And, and sin would be missing, missing this beautiful picture. Now, story starts here. Story ends here. Genesis 3 is not how the story begins, and Genesis 3 is not how the story ends. <laughs> so when we tell the story, we want to make sure that the disruption, the rebellion, the participation in the old order, we may want to make sure that in telling the story, we tell the story how it begins, how it is, and how it ends, but the sin part has to take its proper place in the larger story, and within the larger story, sin, depravity, and the fallen nature of people is in some ways a temporary sort of thing at some, in some ways. We need to make sure that it has, it's taken seriously, but it also takes its proper place in the story, which is a Jesus who does away with the death. Are you with me? So part of it is making sure we get all the parts properly aligned. Uh, now, uh, confession, yad ha, that would be my admission, my recognition, a declaration, my agreement that I have participated in the way of death that I have rebelled, that I have disrupted. Uh, confession actually, con in, Greek, um, in English, con with, fess, like fess up, to say, so it's to say with. Um, and then repentance, the Hebrew word teshuva, it means to turn or to return. The, the Hebrew concept of repentance is I have veered off course and I am invited to return. Isn't that a great re repentance would be? Calling people to repent then is, and if you understand it as return, you were created by a God who loves you. This God created you in this God's image. You were created to be a co-creator. You've been crowned with glory and honor, and the God who makes you invites you to return to your proper place within creation. Nice, huh? That's a, it gets, it's, once again, it, it's dynamic, it's active, it's participation. You've participated in this, and the invitation is to return to proper participation in a creation that's headed somewhere, and we're given this task of properly managing and ordering it, coming alongside of it, helping guide it in a path that brings to increased shalom. Now, the story is about God, then, the gospel story, in Matthew 19, Jesus talks about the renewal of all things. The story is about God renewing all things. In Acts 3, Peter talks about he will return to restore all things, the restoring of all things. Uh, Paul talks in Colossians 1 about the reconciling of all things. And by the way, that phrase, all things, the ta penta in the Greek, it translates literally all things. <laughs> like it, it's, um, it isn't like, oh, but he actually means, no, it, it's all things. Of course, that raises a whole stack of questions. But nevertheless, let's just keep it at this level here. The story is about the renewing of all things, the restoring of all things. Jesus, Peter, Paul, restoring all things, reconciling all things. The story starts here, and the story ends here. Now, uh, okay, things are about to get very interesting. If the story that you are telling begins in Genesis 3, then the central issue is the removal of sin. If your story that you are telling begins in Genesis 3, then the fundamental, we got a problem here. And so your problem, the drive of your story then is getting rid of this problem. And so whatever Savior, Messiah, whatever solutions you present, 
if you begin in Genesis 3, will be centered around, we gotta get rid of this problem. And I got a way to show you how to get rid of this problem. If you begin in Genesis 3, the central issue is removal of sin. If you begin in Genesis 1, the central issue is the restoration of shalom. Woo-wee. Are we, does this make sense? If I'm listening to you tell the story, I am going to quickly pick up, and, and this is, this is one of my, one, kind of one of my central arguments. People may not have theological language, they may not have technical language, they may not be very articulate, but, but I would argue the average person listening to the average sermon begins to pick up a larger story, whether you other claim to be telling a larger story, from the bits and pieces you give them, they will be creating some sort of framework. And if it begins in Genesis 3, they will pick up after a while that the central deal is getting rid of sin. That people pick this stuff up. Does that make sense? They like catch it, they smell it. Um, the removal of sin, if you start in one, then the story is about the restoration of Shalom. And if you begin in one, the removal of sin obviously is a central dimension of the restoration of shalom, but it takes its proper place within the larger story that you are telling. Okay, here we go. If you begin in Genesis 3, then your central story is telling people what you aren't. If you begin in Genesis 1, perhaps you begin with what you are. An evangelism method that begins with we need to go out on the street and convince people that they're sinners is driven by a particular understanding of what the story is. And I would submit to you that it might be beginning a bit late in the story, and it's always good to begin in the beginning. Let me paint you a picture of the world God created for us to inhabit. And it's good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. Perhaps when you begin in Genesis 1, you paint a beautiful picture, perhaps then, in the backdrop, with the backdrop of this big, beautiful, compelling picture of what it means to be human, perhaps then sin makes a whole lot more sense. Oh yeah, I, I get disruption of shalom. You don't have to convince me of my role in that. But if I cold call you, if I walk up to you on the street, okay, just want to talk about you, you're an abomination. <laughs> Man, I just got a raise, I was feeling pretty sweet until now. And that's your good news? What's your bad news? <laughs> uh, 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 that was funny to me. Um, oh, 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 oh. If you begin in Genesis 3, then your fundamental impulse is going to be disembodied evacuation then is going to be the goal. This place is really jacked up, but someday we'll get out of here. Let me tell you how? Because see, if, if, what, if you begin in Genesis 3, it is very easy, if that is the fundamental filter through which you hear the story, it is very easy then to begin to see the materiality of creation as fallen. But the materiality, soil, wine, air, is not fallen. Materiality is not the issue. Rebellion is the issue. The posture of the human heart and participation in ways that disrupt shalom is what's going on here. And it is very easy, if you have only heard it beginning in Genesis 3, to begin to see the wood, soil, wine, air as fundamentally flawed when it, in fact, is the way in which the world is made and God begins with, it is good. Are we preaching yet? <laughs> See, and, and, and for many of you, it's like, okay, 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 get to something new. But I think that what happens is people pick, people over time, they pick this up. I think actually the what you are and what you aren't and what you are 
I think this is when people say, I went to that church, but I just, I, got, I walked out of there feeling beaten up. Anybody ever heard that one? I, I, it's like, I don't need once a week to, to hear how terrible I am. And then the flip side, well, you know what, we tell people the truth and people are sinners and people have to take ownership of that. But, but, but I've heard lots of people very clearly and compellingly articulate the ways in which we've disrupted shalom and it actually provided the kind of space where it, of course I own up to that. Repentance and confession, yeah. Of course I wanna be a part of that and of course I'll own up to my part in that. That, that, that's so beautiful, of course I've disrupted that, I'll, I'll gladly own up to it. But when you begin in Genesis three, it puts me, what do you mean, what do you mean, what do you mean? Now, a disembodied evacuation then, or participatory physicality, is this story ultimately about getting you out of here, or about proper participation with our creator in the ongoing creation of the world, bringing increased shalom to the world that is our home that God said is good. If underneath it all, the preacher that you're listening to believes, when all is said and done, if you really, really, really pushed her on exactly what she story she's telling, if underneath it all, at like this level, this level, this level, down here somewhere, if you're, she, you're, what is it really, if she truly believes that the action is ultimately somewhere else, I'm going to pick that up after a while. How many of you have heard a teaching that was great and then at the end out of nowhere, two minutes was tagged on in which you were taught what you need to do to get out of here. How many of you know what I'm taught? And, and you're like, well, so what was that thing on the front end? That's like a really long intro that has really nothing to do apparently. Or have you heard something that was very, very powerful and somebody critiqued it by saying, but they didn't give the gospel. And as you begin to probe what exactly that meant, it was, but we weren't told how to evacuate this place with our soul. How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? The problem is that's not how the story begins and that's not how the story ends. And I get concerned that there are folks who will be on the way up somewhere while God is coming down and they'll pass in the air. <laughs> I go, home. Where, where, where are you going? Oh, man. Okay, John does a very interesting thing. In John chapter two, John talks about Jesus turning water into wine and then he says this was his first sign. Then a little while later in John 4, Jesus heals the official son and John says this was his second sign. And then partway through, he uses the word sign but he stops numbering them. He's like, I, it's, it's like, I think it's four or five, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> if you actually count when Jesus does what John kind of categorizes as a sign, you end up with water into wine, one. Official son, two. At the pool, three. The, turning the, um, the bread, four. Water, five. Walking on water, five. Heals a blind man, six. And then in John 11, he raises a man from the dead, which is the seventh sign. And John, he, it's almost like they're like blinking lights, like, by the way, have you noticed that the raising of the dead is the seventh one? Hmm. Seven, in Jewish consciousness, is a number most closely associated with what? Creation. Remember that uh, um, for a good Jew, everything means something else. Seven would have been a number that would have jumped out. And the signs build. We start with wine, but by the seventh, man, we're raising a man something from the dead. And so when Jesus is resurrected, that would be the eighth sign. Well, if seven refers 
to the first week of creation, then what would an eighth sign be the first day of a new creation? <laughs> wow, I actually, um, I talked about this somewhere else. I, and, and Mary doesn't recognize Jesus and thinks he's a gardener. That, if there ever, the actual Greek there is parentheses, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> There's a new creation. The old creation had a death problem. The new creation doesn't. The resurrection inaugurates a new creation. First seven days are done, this is an eighth day. It's a Monday, but it's a different kind of Monday. Maybe you can say it this way. The story is about Jesus' resurrection beginning a new creation right here in the midst of this one. So when we preach the resurrection, at the center of everything is a belief that something big is going down and it's happening right here in the midst of the old creation. Now the implications of this are just endless, but uh, let, let, just a couple more. Um, the story of Jesus' resurrection is about God reaffirming the goodness of creation. We're free to enjoy it because it's good. We're free to take part in participatory physicality, ordering it, managing it, steering it, directing it, guiding it, embracing it. Because the resurrection is God, or reaffirming or affirming or just reminding us that God never stopped affirming creation. However, you, you want to, the goodness of creation. Death that has stained and corrupted creation at, at all sorts of levels. Underneath it all, when God made the world, God said it is good and God intends to restore it, renew it, and reconcile it. And God is looking for partners. Because the reality at its core is not static but dynamic. It's got up to, how can I be a part of it? Now, the story is about anticipating the coming day when heaven and earth are one again. Parentheses, heaven is where God is storing the earth's future. <laughs> <laughs> the story starts here and ends here. The story starts, heaven and earth are one. There is no other place. What death has done is essentially sort of a sort of splitting of the realms. This is why Paul says, well, if I die right now, I'll, I'll be with Christ. Of course. Wherever that is or however that is, there's a bit of discussion. But nevertheless, Paul's assumption and assurance is, if I die right now, I will be with Christ. But the story, wherever that is, is about there and here coming back together so ultimately when you're here there is no there correct so the story is about anticipating the coming day when heaven and earth are one again by the way when jesus teaches his disciples to pray your, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven live now in anticipation of what god is intending to do for all of creation so and then he talks about eternal life is now he talks about the life of heaven here, stepping into eternal life now, properly participating with God now in such a way that the way that you are living could go on forever. Now, uh, heaven is where God is storing the earth's future. <laughs> I love that. Um, that'd be a sweet bumper sticker. People would be like, what? <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> now, let's, uh, the implications of this, obviously I'm sure for you, you're already like, Oh my goodness, blah, 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 blah. let me just suggest maybe a couple things that, that I think are important, and, and obviously this is no sort of last word, but hopefully maybe this can start some first words. Business. Business is the exchange of goods. Fair price for a fair product. Business in our world, investment, brokering, trading, clothes, food, transportation, all of us in this exchange involving work, wage, and things that we need, 
is actually rooted in a common good. Everybody having what they need. So somebody in business is taking part if the key idea in creation is it dasha, it produces and sprouts. Well, it produces and sprouts things from which we make food, from which we make clothing, from which we make houses, from which we make books. Business is very dasha. The earth produces, and then we take it and hopefully, properly, order it and use it to further shalom as we all live together. By the way, there are lots of, uh, there's a new movement among businesses called Triple Bottom Line. And Triple Bottom Line is, uh, and there's some Christians who are really spearheading a movement of going to businesses and saying, what if you had a triple bottom line? Not just profit, but how your business affects the environment and how your business affects people. Essentially, Christians say, what does it look like to think in terms of shalom with your business. Which I think is brilliant. How, how can, which is essentially saying, how can you, as Genesis 1 and 2 is about the proper ordering of creation, business is a vital, necessary task, a holy, sacred calling of helping organize, manage, steward, order creation. If your story begins in Genesis 1 and 2. If your story begins in Genesis 3, what can often happen is a two-tiered system develops. You're a business person, you make money? Well, I've been called into full-time ministry. <laughs> because the earth is fundamentally suspect. But there is a higher, you work with soil, I work with spirit. Soil is here. Spirit is here. I have been called, and what I do is help people escape soil. I give them what they need to disengage from it, because the real action is here. Are you with me? So what happens for the businesswoman? She says things then like, I know, I'm, I'm just a business person, but I try and make money and give it away. Which essentially says what? I'm not in the game. But through the game, I make money, and then I hand it over to people who are in the game. And so I said, no, I'm, I just do this thing. It's not really, it's not really that, but, but uh, maybe someday I'll be able to make enough that I can then leave that, and I'll have enough time to devote to the higher plane. But in Genesis 1 and 2, soil and spirit are united. In Genesis 1 and 2, everything is blessed. In Genesis 1 and 2, one of the central tasks is the proper ordering of things. So no wonder sometimes people come and say things in your office like, I don't know, I just go to work, and I just want to get out of work, and I just want to do ministry. And you're thinking, every day, you go to an office full of people who you have contact with them all day and they're hurting and wounded and trying to make sense of the world and you have every day endless opportunities to engage and talk with them and they trust you and like you and you want to get out of that so that you can be a part of the action? <laughs> Are you, right? You're going, okay, wait, wait. You're... This is like, this person is a missionary, they just pay their own way. <laughs> Perhaps when you begin to read it with Genesis 1 and 2, all sorts of things start to kind of pop and explode. Whoa, is it possible that my sermon is handing people a sort of bifurcated world in which there is the action and then there is the other stuff that's just, you know, that's just kind of how, the, how we run the world. All the stuff that just kind of has to get done so that we can get, but, but perhaps what Jesus was trying to teach and endlessly pointing to is an awareness that, oh no, no, you're a minister. The kingdom is advancing, it's here, it's now, it's upon you. I just think this has huge, huge implications. Let's talk about art. Uh, if 
it is a dynamic, not a static reality, and it's going somewhere, and it's producing, and it's sprouting, and all that. Th then art is just the, the creative arranging of that. It's aesthetics. The tree was good, the, the fruit was pleasing to the eye. I mean, it's, aesthetics are right there in Genesis 1 and 2, and they're absolutely vital. And the impracticality of art is part of its central purpose. God doesn't just love you for what you create. Efficiency, production, isn't God's highest value for you. Because God created the world and it's good and God wants you to enjoy it. One of, the, one of the values of art is it reminds us that not everything and not all of our worth is based on how hard we work and how good we are. Because it just is. But in a Genesis 3 understanding of the story, everything is suspect. In a Genesis 1 and 2 understanding, God blesses creation and the people God places within it. And so making things is already blessed. If I then, when I create something, need to give it a Christian blessing stamp, I am essentially saying I'm going to do something that apparently God hasn't done. And I wonder if God is saying, I already did that a long time ago. You are spending a lot of energy defining and labeling. I took care of that. Just make it. And then whatever you do in your acceptance speech, don't say, don't thank me. Because I don't think it's that good. But um, <laughs> no, 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 no. I actually think this is, this is the problem for you when people start trying to label things. Well, is it a Christian whatever? And you're like, all I know is it's more humming with reverence and awe than some of the things that had the Christian label on them. That thing didn't use any of the language, but it was more true and Jesus-y than the stuff that had Jesus-y and blinking lights on the label. Come on now. And I want, and so we, intuit, oh, and this especially, think about this in parenting. When parents try and divide the world up into what's Christian and what isn't. And then this kid won't fit with the labeling system. And so obviously with this, we need to pray about this kid. There's, probably, there's issues here in his growth and we, we're not quite sure if, they're, if the faith is really sticking. But the kid may actually get it more than the system that the kid has been handed. Because the kid intuitively is picking up on a blessing on creation all around the place. And the kid is going, if I have to choose between the thing that's real and blessed and that labeling system, I'm gonna go with this. And the labeling system's like, whoa, 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 whoa. But if we read a Genesis 1 and 2 properly, then we aren't surprised. And so we, we and, and I'm not, I mean, there are obviously times where you're like, okay, that stuff right there is generally quite destructive and doesn't bring much, and that stuff, that, I mean, there's not that there isn't discernment, but that seems to be, oh, the rabbis say this, God begins the story by separating light from dark, and that is our task, separating light from dark. And so the discernment then obviously becomes the primary Virtue. Perhaps that's why sometimes the label says, or this one. We're just using music for something else. And so something that is holy and sacred only then become already, it's already blessed. It only then becomes valid if it can be used for something else. Which is really saying this thing is no good unless it can be essentially exploited to get us somewhere else. But in Genesis 1 and 2, it's just blessed and sacred because it is. Because God made it and said it's good. And then, um, maybe just to get some discussions, right, justice, issues of justice, the poor, the oppressed, billion people don't have drinking water, half the world lives on less than two American dollars a day, 800 million people will go to sleep hungry tonight. A Genesis 3 understanding is, okay, that stuff is nice, I guess, if you have time. But if the story is about God restoring all things, 
Everything from empty stomachs to empty hearts. Reconciling all things, renewing all things. Then issues of justice, and if Genesis 1 and 2 is about the proper ordering of creation, if 80% of the world lives in substandard housing, then we aren't ordering creation well. One of the things um, I've read is that there is enough food in the world. The problems come in distribution. So apparently the earth is fully capable of properly feeding everybody. But what's gotten in the way? Disruption, rebellion, participation, missing. So these issues in Genesis 1 and 2, there's justice is everything in its proper place. And so then justice issues don't become things for, for people who have extra time on their hands or um, wh whatever. Justice then becomes a natural part of the story that God is telling. Our, and if there are multiple dimensions of shalom, then there is our restoration to our creator, our restoration to each other, our, our restoration, our broken relationship with the earth. And so justice then, of course, is part of the story that we're telling. And I think sometimes this is the thing about, well, wait, 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 is the gospel um, what we say or what we do, or is the gospel um, the heart, or is it the larger system and all that? Well, if we have a story that begins in Genesis 1 and 2, then we don't endlessly have to decide if it's this or this because we have an understanding that, that it's all embraced in God's desire to put it all back together. Sometimes I, um, sometimes I think uh, what's thing has helped me is whenever you find those situations where is it this or is it this, you know, is it this or is it this? Is it what we say or what we do? Is it the individual human heart or is it the whole system? Is it this? And I always go, man, it looks like you're about to embrace the whole thing. Um, now, a sermon then is the continuing insistence that through the resurrection of Jesus, a whole new world is bursting forth right in the midst of this one and everybody everywhere can be a part of it. So a, a sermon centers around the resurrection, but it centers around an insistence that there's something happening right in the midst of this one, and everybody everywhere can be a part of that. You may have seen it before. You may have seen it, and it wasn't properly labeled, apparently, but it was the thing. Or perhaps you saw it in places where you're like, ah, man, that was the last place I expected. That's what you saw. This also... Well, we'll get to that in a second. It's the continuing insistence that through the resurrection of Jesus, a whole new world is bursting forth right in the midst of this one, and everybody everywhere can be a part of it. A sermon, then, is about helping people see this new creation with their own eyes. One of the gifts of the sermon is empowering and equipping people to be able to spot it. Um, also, let's keep this here. A couple, a couple um, truths that flow out of this. What you look for, you will find. What you look for, you will find. If you look for churches that make you embarrassed to be a Christian, you may find them if that's what you're looking for. You meet people who are like, dude, I just want nothing to do with Christianity and all that because of the da 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 da. If you look for that, I'm sure you can find it. I'm sure you can. But um, I'm trying to think. Uh, 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 how old is she? 18, 19 year old girl three weeks ago said to me, every Christian I know has been coming to our church for probably grew up at our church, probably been there seven or eight years. Every Christian I know is totally lame and Christianity is pathetic. And why would I ever want to be that? Thanks. <laughs> but, but I said to her, what about, and we was right after a church service. <clears throat> I said, what about that woman right there who just said to that other woman, you lost your job, and I've decided that I am gonna pay your grocery bill until you get a new one? problem is I don't know what to do with that. 
And what about that, those folks over there? You know what they just did? They just sold most of their possessions in order to rescue a couple of orphans. That's why those two little kids are with them and they aren't the same skin color because those people just said, these kids don't have a home and we need to take care of them and give them a home. So the problem is, they have a sense that that was what Jesus wanted them to do and they did it. So my problem is, you've seen that, but my problem is I've seen that and now you've seen that. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and sometimes I wonder if really, really good teaching and preaching is there's a sort of tour guide dimension to it. Hey, check this out. Sometimes I think one of the gifts you give people is you show them something that they would at first blush and f- they would thin slice it as there's nothing there for me. No resurrection going on there. Sometimes I think one of the gifts is you show something in which we have instantaneous sort of judgments about its unredemptive nature, and you go, hey, Bible, check this out. Now look behind it. Now look over there. Now look over there. And all of a sudden, they're like, wow, now I can't see that thing anymore. Now, a sermon then brings hope rooted not in escape but engagement, not in evacuation, but reclamation, not in leaving, but staying and overcoming. (laughs) See, see, there is sometimes a hope. You'll pick up like a, oh, no, it's okay, I have hope. But the hope, it's called conservative materialism is the actual technical title. It is hope in I'm going to get out of here someday. The resurrection is not a hope rooted in some other place in a disembodied evacuation. The resurrection is hope for this world, the one that God is renewing, restoring, reconciling. And if you think through then, if you begin in Genesis 3 or Genesis 1, a conservative materialistic view which essentially says, we'll get out of here someday and that's our hope, what it really is saying is everything up till then is kind of hanging around. Its hope comes from the story and narrative it is constructed about someday. The resurrection hope begins here and now. That is a very, very different hope. It may use the word hope, but the hope The engine of the hope comes from two very different impulses. The one is something has gone down in the resurrection that affects everything right now, beginning with me here and you here now. The other is a hope that someday something will happen somewhere that somehow then we'll look back and and this will all begin to make sense. The other has a much more, the other, and, and once again, I would simply say that I think people smell this stuff. I think when people use words like it was relevant, they're really tapping into a deep, it somehow unlocked something here and now, which is wonderfully the story of the scriptures. And then um, let's do one more. Um, A sermon then is never surprised when grace, beauty, meaning, order, compassion, truth, and love show up in all sorts of unexpected people and places because it always has been God's world, it is God's world, and it always will be God's world. This, then, gives you a freedom. You can quote, if, it, if that quote If that movie clip, if that philosopher, if that, the whole world is your rhetorical toolbox. Also then, this in some senses frees us when we stumble upon something, it's like, okay, that's real, that's true, that's that's humming with reverence. That's got resurrection written all over it. Sometimes there's a, okay, I'm gonna gonna point to it, but then I'm instantly gonna give the disclaimer. Now, as far as I know, this person isn't a born-again believer. But I think for this one, I was praying about five minutes stretch of time, I think they were onto something. You, you, this frees you. You don't always have to then add a caveat, uh, correct? It, was this person created by God? Well, oh, yeah. Did God create them in God's image? Yeah. Are they living in God's world? Yeah. Did God give them the ability to think and reason and speech and feel? Yeah. Sweet. This frees me to live in God's world and tell a particular story. And, and if this helps, 
The whole world is your toolbox. And that's actually what you're trying to teach people, a big, generous view of God. Now, obviously, there's been a significant amount of distortion, disruption, destruction, rebellion, participation. Of course, of course, obviously. But the resurrection is about a whole new creation bursting forth right here in the midst of this one. And our task and joy is trying to help people have the kind of eyes through which they can see it for themselves. So the story anticipates a coming day and it lives in the reality of that coming day now. We act in such a way that our actions and the consequences of our actions can extend on forever into this world. Uh, Maybe one way to say it is, is I wanna be a part of things that will be in that new world, that will endure, that when everything is in its bright and proper place, when there is harmony within hierarchy, when soil and spirit and all this, I want to act in such a way that my actions will, will flow right on in to that. And it won't be like, what's that? That can't fit here. So, there's just a few thoughts for you.